Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon. Okay. I would like to welcome you all at the Entrepreneurs Week, and we're very glad to welcome our distinguished speaker for today. Our distinguished speaker for today is the CEO of Creative Commons, a non for profit organization which proposes a middle way of rights management rather than the extremes of pure public domains and the reservation of all rights. He's the founder and CEO of Newtony, a venture capital firm focused on personal communication and enabling technologies. Um, he also invested in Flickr, Twitter, Last FM. Uh, six Apart and Technorati. In 1997, Time ranked him as a member of the Cyber Elite. In 2000, he was ranked among the 50 stars of Asia by Business Week and commended by the Japanese Ministry of Posts and Telecommunication for supporting the advancement of IT. In 2001, the World Economic Forum chose him as one of the 100 global leaders of tomorrow. Uh, for 2002, chosen by Newsweek as member of the leaders of the PAC, which means high technology industry. Um, in 2005, um, he listed by Vanity Fairs as a member of the next establishment. Um, in October 2007, Joey was also named by Business Week as one of the 25th or 25 most influential people of the web in 2008. Also, a big, he's also a big fan of industrial music and the famous MMOPRG games. World of Warcraft, where he spent his free time raiding the world with his guild. Please join me welcoming Joey Ito. Hi, everybody. Uh, it looks like there are not scary old people here, so I'm going to take my jacket <laughs> off. Um. <laughs> no, you're not scary. <laughs> so I want to talk uh, about innovation in open networks. I think some of you were at the talk I gave, uh, the little short one, so there's going to be a little bit of overlap, but I hope uh, I'll have uh, new material. And some of it is a little bit uh, technical and legal, so if you have questions, we'll have some Q&A at the end. Um, but uh, open networks, when I say open networks, I mean open networks in a technical way as well as open networks in a business way. I think that if you're growing up today, we are kind of in a hybrid situation. And so an example of a closed network is uh, when you have a big government funding into a big research lab, and you have to have a PhD to join this company, and you have to be 45 years old before you have a budget, and you create these open stand these standards in these government bodies, and it's a, like a telephone company system is, is a relatively closed system that requires lots of government approvals, big research funding, and big companies to create this machine. Right? And some industries, a lot of infrastructure industries, this is the best way to do it, you know, in, in, in construction, and uh, many of the things that we do, we don't want little startup companies um, you know, r running some of this big uh, infrastructure like, say, a, 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 a train terminal or something like that. But my argument is that uh, a lot of the really valuable innovation these days, the Googles of the world, are coming from a new kind of innovation that's very different from the old kind of in innovation. And the entrepreneurship of the old days, the entrepreneurship, if you think about the railroad barons who built this infrastructure across the U.S. and, and you know, um, people who built the oil companies and things like that. It's a very different kind of entrepreneurship that we have today, which is about open networks. There's a um, David Weinberger, who's an author in the United States, has a great phrase that I like. He calls it, the internet is small pieces loosely joined. So if you look at the great companies uh, or the great products, like the browser, which is the small lab in Illinois. You know, if you look at uh, uh, many of the, the, the Google, it was basically just two guys had most of it done before they really had to raise money. And a lot of these 
parts, the reason why they're small pieces is that we have open standards that connect to each other, and you just build your little piece and you connect to everybody else, and somebody else is taking care of the network, somebody is taking care of the operating system, and it's a lot of little guys working together in this loosely organized network, and there's no central planner. This is another big difference between if you think of the Soviet Union, where they tried to plan everything. Once it gets too complex, it fails. And the world is very, very complex today, and it's a lot easier to have lots of little pieces that connect to each other. Each piece takes care of their own responsibility, their own risk, and you have a standard in which you connect with each other. And so this kind of network, this mesh where anyone can connect, is, I think, the future of this new kind of innovation, especially um, in IT. Um, and uh, the way that I look at this is, I look at this, this is my um, bathroom around, I'm trying to remember the year now, it's, uh, I think 1992, maybe. So this is the first commercial internet service provider in Japan. And we built it in my bathroom because the Cisco router that we had was so noisy, it sounded like an airplane. But before we could build the internet, um, what happened was, and I think in many countries still, um, in a lot of uh, countries, it's still illegal to connect something to the telephone network without approval from the government. So in Japan and even in the United States, it used to be all of the equipment, everything was designed and built and dist distributed by the telephone company, and it was all built through Bell Labs and these central agencies. The big difference about the internet was anybody can connect without asking permission, and once you're connected, you're connected to the rest of the world. So there's a, there's a standard body that used to, org this doesn't look very organized, but used to organize the standards around this thing, um, well, they still organize it. It's called the Internet Engineering Task Force. And it's a bunch of email lists and a bunch of kids that everyone can participate. And we have this uh, phrase that we use called rough consensus running code, which basically means we, it, we, if somebody wants to figure out how to do email or if somebody wants to figure out a new way to do uh, mobile communication, what they do is they generally come up with uh, agreement. It doesn't have to be this long voting process. But the most important thing is somebody writes a little bit of code, some software, and you run the code, and then everybody looks at the running software, and uh, it evolves from there. And rough consensus running code is very different from what the uh, ITU and the CCITT before this, these government um, run things, which are still important for things like GSM and some of these big, huge infrastructures. But for things like internet, it's very difficult. So at the same time that internet was coming out, it was competing with another standard called X25, which was the telephone company version of the internet. And for that, they had to have an agreement with every single country that you, uh, you, you connected with. It had a metered payment system. It was a very complicated system. And the, the specification to write the, the software for it was like this. So you couldn't, as one small group, write software for the uh, telephone company network. You really needed a team of 100 people. But the whole trick about the internet is all these little pieces, this router, uh, this is a news server, and all these pieces, I could sit down, read a short manual, and I could immediately be writing software that was useful. And it's about for the simplicity and small pieces. And also, before, y you couldn't compete with a telephone company. And so when we tried to launch internet in Japan, we had lawyers writing, internet is illegal. How can you connect to every country without an agreement? Who's going to take responsibility for this? This is going to be a technical disaster, blah, 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 blah. And, but the Americans just went ahead and did it, because that's the way Americans are. And the Europeans kind of resisted to the end, because that's the way the Europeans are. And the Japanese, being Japanese, they say, oh, we're using CCITT, but they started letting us do internet on the side. That's the way Japanese are. So, so we built the internet service providers, and we built the internet in Japan. Um, and right now, I think there's a lot of similarities. I don't know enough about the region, but there are a lot of similarities. Um, if you go into, I think, you know, South Africa is actually quite advanced in all of Africa. It's the only country where we have Creative Commons licenses, and we have very strong IT. Um, but I think in, in, in the Africa region, and also in, in the Middle East, it reminds me a lot of Japan um, when I was doing this, where you have a lot of big companies who are still trying to protect. Um, and some of these companies are good, important companies. They pay a lot of tax. They have a lot of smart people. And we have to sort of talk to them about the fact that unless you open it up, unless you let this mess into your network, you don't get the Googles of the world and the Amazons of the world and the Ebays of the world. Because just like I was connecting this network uh, without asking permission, you don't want every single web page to have to ask permission uh, to, to innovate. Because what happens when you try to ask permission is it creates a, a friction and a cost of failure. And this is something that we talked about, we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, 
this is the stack. I showed this again uh, yesterday, but um, just for the people who weren't there. I'm a technical guy, so this is the way I look at the world, right? I look at it in stacks. So a long time ago, computers, you couldn't physically connect them together. The cables didn't connect together. So if you bought a DEC computer and an IBM computer, you had to get some hardware to connect them together. And then the Ethernet um, protocol allowed this same cable to talk the same way so two computers could connect. Now, the technical guys will say this is a little bit too simple. There's a little, this is slightly more complex than this. TCP IP was a protocol created originally for the US government to create a packet switching network. Um, and this is uh, the basic um, network architecture of the internet. So this is like when you say, when you're setting up your Wi-Fi router, ask for your IP address, that's TCP IP. This gives every single computer on the internet an IP number and allows all the computers to talk to each other regardless of what computer it was. So before, you probably don't, most of the young people don't remember, you couldn't connect and file share between a Mac and a Windows machine because Mac used uh, Apple Talk and Windows used Banyan Vines or Windows or whatever and you had to buy some kind of networking software to connect the computers together and you had to pay a networking software engineer if you wanted to connect your network together in your company. When TCP IP came out it was free software, an open specification managed by the IETF that I mentioned earlier and then suddenly I, I remember downloading a TCP IP to my Mac and downloading TCP IP to my Unix machine and downloading TCP IP to Windows and suddenly they were connected, right? And this created the internet and it got rid of a huge cost which was these network engineers and network software. The next important, you know, and because of this, this is why we could create the internet, right? And the only reason this worked was because it was open source, free, and not controlled by any company, not controlled by any government. The same with ethernet. Um, and again, ethernet is not the best, smartest protocol. Actually, it's actually kind of dumb. But it's so dumb that anyone could make it and it became a standard. It's the same with many, many things. So for instance, there used to be something so that most people probably know what HTTP or HTML is. It's the standard of the web. Well, there was a standard before that called SGML, which the printers used, looked a lot like HTML. But it was about this thick to read the manual to use SGML. And it was a problem was it was for professionals, it was for big companies, and no one could use it for anything. There were only a couple software packages in the whole world that used it. HTML was really skimpy, you know. And when the browser guys made the blink tag, uh, you guys probably don't remember, but you used to be able to go blink, and it would start, let the characters on the screen flash. And all these old SGML guys you got so mad, you know, because we're breaking the architecture, we're just a bunch of young guys creating tags, going crazy. But the thing is, it spread like crazy, right? Because it was simple, it kept changing, and the process for doing the standardization wasn't stodgy. It was a lightweight system. And a lot of people during, when the web came out, they said, oh, it's stupid, you don't need it. We have universities connected, we have the databases. You can go in and do a database query, look it up, go to another one. Why do you need to put it on some page and make it look pretty? Why does it have to be so simple to use? We, all of our software engineers already know how to do SQL databases and blah, blah, blah. Well, the thing is, this democratized the content space so that anybody could make a website. And that was such a big difference that it created. Because I think it wouldn't, eBay would not have happened if it weren't for the web, obviously, now, in retrospect. But back then, they thought, before we had it, you don't need this. Now, this is another very important part, is that before the web, almost every guy you talk to, every woman you talk to would say, if you s explained what the web was, they said, why would we need that? But after you have the web, it's obvious, of course we need it, right? And it's this, that's, the, that's the kind of other very interesting thing about innovation and uh, is that before you make it, it's, very, it's not obvious. eBay, Linux, uh, Amazon, even search engines, people are, before you make it, they'll say, why would we give you, this is what good venture capitalists do, is they say, okay, we, gonna, we have no idea if this is gonna be a good idea, but we're gonna bet on it because the people are good, because maybe this is a chance and in fact, you know, I do a lot of investing in, in Silicon Valley. I'm an investor in Twitter. Everyone's asking me, you know, what's the business model? You know, it doesn't matter. It's going crazy. It's super popular. And the web is full of ways to convert traffic into money. Some people are having a harder time than others, like you know, YouTube is losing a million and a half dollars a day, but they're thinking very hard. But I think that it's much harder now to generate traffic and come up with something new than it is to figure out how to turn a bunch of users into money. And I think that what's really important is that what we're learning from all these innovations is that 
the really big hits, which are the ones that make venture capitalists rich, the ones that change society, the ones that enable completely new things, are things that you can't really imagine until they exist. Right? So this is the kind of innovation also that requires a very low cost of failure because most of them are going to fail. And I'll talk about it more later, but I think that each of these is removing a kind of friction by creating an open standard, which creates an explosion of innovation, both profit and non-profit, because we have Wikipedia, we have all kinds of non-profit uses as well. And I think that the next big friction right now, as we find, is a legal friction. Right? So whenever somebody may, brings me a music deal, or any deal that involves user-generated content, or, 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 or any content at all, the biggest risk is the lawyers. Right? YouTube goes out the door, gets sued for a billion dollars by, um, by, by a problem. Right? And you can't sustain the legal costs of doing all the transactions and all of the um, content clearing that's happening on the internet today. And this is the biggest um, thing that's holding back, I think, the next layer of explosion, of innovation. And I'll talk about how I think we're going to try to fix that. Um, there's a very cool guy named Clay Shirky, uh, who teaches in New York. And this is his presentation. And it's licensed under a Creative Commons license, which means I can use it as long as I give him credit. So that's his bald head there. Um, so he, he gave a very interesting presentation called uh, Failure for Free. And I'll just zip through some of the slides because I think it's quite interesting. So he did an analysis of um, SourceForge, which is the uh, open source repository where you put all the free software projects. Right? And he was showing that uh, in the 100 percentile um, game, which is a, a instant messaging software, is uh, very successful. They have about a million downloads. Okay. So this is a, a hit uh, open source project. But if you go down to the 99.5 percentile, uh, you'll find that only about 50,000 downloads uh, actually. So if you look, it's like uh, thousands of downloads, right? The, at the most, 50,000 downloads. If you go down to the 90th percentile, you're in single double digits. Only like 30, 40 people have downloaded your software. This is the top 10% of all of the projects only getting this many users. And then you look at the 74, 75th percent at zero. 75% of open source projects on SourceForge have zero downloads, right? And if you go back, um, let's see if this works. If you go back, even the top 10%, it's only tens of users, right? So what we're saying here is that less than a percent are successful, and less than less than a percent are super successful. Right? So what this means, if you're thinking about this in terms of a company, what if you were saying, OK, less than a percent of the projects in this company are successful? That's a huge failure rate. Right? And if you think in a Japanese trading company, we would spend about $3 million to decide whether to do a project. And then the average project costs uh, 10 to $100 million. This is a tremendous amount of money to fail. But the thing about um, this open source is the cost of failure is nearly zero because it's a couple guys, a couple girls who get together, write some software, try, if that doesn't work, they try something else. And so this is the curve of the downloads versus the ranking. Um, and this is a very interesting post. So this is Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux. And this is a post that he posted in 1991 to Usenet. It says, hello everybody using Linux. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby. Won't be big and professional like GNU. Uh, it's been brewing since April, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, you know, very humble note. Now, on this day, on the 25th in, of, April, of August, there are probably hundreds of notes like this of people starting projects. And if, you, if this were a company proposal thing, I bet no one would have funded Linux. It sounds like a stupid side project hobby, right? This is one of the reasons Google lets all their engineers have hobbies, because they realize that this is how you come up with new ideas is not by planning everything, but by letting people mess around. But this is the, the importance is that you don't know which one is going to be the next Linux and which one is going to be the next failure. And again, the cost of failure being low is very important. And so um, to take this, so this is on the one end. So open source free software is nearly free to fail. Um, I will say my average investment is about $50,000 to $100,000. The average round that I invest in is about $100,000 to $300,000. Usually when I invest, they already have a product. They already have um, about 50,000 users. So like Last FM and these guys, like Six Apart, and they had 100, 200,000 users. Um, they have a growth like this. Uh, they don't have a revenue model yet. Um, and that's when the angels invest. Okay? 
And then as they get bigger and bigger and bigger and the product gets tuned and the ramp goes up and maybe they might sometimes have a business model and all they need now is some servers because everything is crashing like when Twitter was falling down all over the place. That's when they need $10 million, $20 million to put the servers up. But at that point there's very little risk, right? I mean there's still risk that Twitter doesn't come up with a business model. There's still risk uh, that you know, was risk that last FM couldn't figure out business model. But at that point as a product there is very little risk and all you need is money to scale it up. So there's a lot, a lot less risk for the VC who's putting in the $5 million, $10 million. For the angel investor, the risk is $50,000, $100,000, not so bad. Happy to roll the dice if the entrepreneur is a good entrepreneur and you already get the users. And this is also a really big difference in the past because the cost of just making something, because the software like Ruby on Rails and with Linux and all these things, I mean, to put Google together probably only costs a couple of thousand dollars, I would bet in terms of hardware. I mean, if you had built this inside of IBM or inside of a telephone company, it would have cost $100 million. So the cost of setting up and running and testing Google was nearly nothing. They just connected to their Stanford computer network and the whole world would try it and say, yay, this is great. And so on the open source, you have nearly free and then you go all the way up. Now imagine if you're trying to do this inside of a huge company. The cost is extremely expensive because, you know, my entrepreneurs, they sit in an apartment and they eat cup noodles and drink Kool-Aid and they work really hard. And their cost is nearly, z nearly zero, not zero, but nearly zero. But if you think about a fully loaded, you know, qualified uh, PhD with a manager and then the manager's manager and the manager's manager and the accountant and the office and the air conditioning, it's a huge cost just to try to fiddle around with stuff. And so what, what, why the West Coast of America is doing much better than the East Coast of America in terms of innovation is because it's far away from the successful big companies and it's far away from the government. Because, and, and in fact, it was the unemployment when a lot of the semiconductor industries failed that these unemployed, very educated people with no money were the ones that came up with all the good ideas. Japan, all the big companies like Honda, and this, is, this isn't even before internet, all these people were the people who were fired, lost their work because the big military complex had failed, right? I remember when blogging, so after the first bubble, the reason blogs were so successful was because there are so many unemployed smart people writing blogs, right? So I think that what you have to understand is that for real innovation, it's all of my good investments are always at the bottom, right? All of my blog, Technorati, all these guys I invested at the bottom, you know? And Flickr was also at the bottom of this curve. It's when people are unemployed, people are creative, you've got no noise. So the people who are trying to make easy money are gone. You've got a lot of people who are focused on the product. You have to have a lot of, you build trust. People are focused on making something good and try, instead of trying to make quick money. So to, if you turn it around to a, an emerging market where you have a lot of young people, you have a lot of motivated people, the fact that you don't have venture capitalists, maybe it's a good thing because a lot of times they screw stuff up. You know? It's better to try to start things fresh, but I think, I mean, I was listening to some of the comments you guys were making earlier and I was very invigorated. And I think it really is about um, building a passion and taking risk. But you have to take risk. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and explain a little bit about copyright because I don't think people understand how much of a burden copyright is on innovation right now. These are Lawrence Lessig's slides. So that's right here. He's um, my predecessor and the founder of Creative Commons. So if this circle is all of the uses of a book, everything you can imagine to use a book, and it most everything that you would use a book for are un is unregulated. So you can read a book, you can give a book to somebody, you can sell a book, you can sleep on a book. None of these trigger any kind of law that prohibits you or inhibits you in doing anything. These are not regulated activities you do with a book. There's a small area inside of what you can do with a book that is regulated by copyright. So you can't copy a book and sell it to somebody else. Now this is primarily produced to pr to protect the author and the publisher from commercial exploitation, from losing revenue because somebody else copied a book and sold it instead of them. Okay? So if you look at all the original texts and, and, and uh, laws about copyright, it was to prevent one company from stealing money from another company by taking their resources away. But there's also this very, in the US it's called fair use, in different countries it's different, but there's a small sliver of use which is you're allowed to cite a book or use a book for academic purposes um, without asking permission. Um, because uh, that, that's what we called fair use, right? But generally speaking, you weren't allowed to copy things, but most people never copied anything anyway, right? You didn't need to copy anything to read it or to sleep on it. So most uses of books were free. Most uses that were regulated were commercial. 
And also, you couldn't legally, you couldn't control it anyway. If you wanted to say, I want to charge you every time you read a book, you, there's no way you could have done it legally or uh, technically. So as we went into the digital world, what we realized is every time you load a browser page, you're making a copy. Every time that Google wants to make an index of a book, they're making a copy. Every time you give a book to somebody, you're making a copy. Every single thing you try to do causes a copy. You can't be on the internet for more than a second without making a copy of something. So now, as you saw, most things were unregulated. But in the digital world, every use is a copy. Thus, under copyright law, you must ask permission to you to before you can make any copy of anything. That's the law. So copyright says that anybody that has come, yep. Okay, I, I'll give you guys the slides later if you want. Okay, I'll send you the link. Um, so, copyright law basically says any any scribble on a notebook, you are the copyright owner. And for anybody to make a copy of that scribble, they have to ask your permission. Which basically means every single piece of content on the internet, if you want to look at it, legally speaking, you must ask for permission. Right? And asking for permission means you have to hire a lawyer and talk to this guy. So. Now, the used to be all this unregulated space, most of it is now regulated. And the other thing is, because of the technology, suddenly you can control. So all these publishers used to say, oh no, the internet is going to be very scary, because all these guys can make these copies and steal everything. Well, if you look at Amazon.com, or look at the Kindle. I love my Kindle, but I can't give books in my Kindle to my friends. Have you noticed that? Now they're starting to say, oh, in Japan, you can watch TV, you can copy it, but you can only watch it five times and it erases itself. Right now, they're starting to think about, can we charge per page? Can we charge per view? And then these publishers, some of them are saying, well, you know, we already have this model of you can't give it to your friends. These used bookstores should pay us extra royalties when they sell books. And so they're actually trying to bring this control into the real world. So this technology has also added control. And so just to go back for one second. The, so, so the digital world has really changed copyright. So every single person who used to, if we had, were here before the computer, none of us would care about copyright. It was irrelevant to our lives. Now it's relevant to all of our lives. And we're all lawbreakers, and we're all copyright violators. Right? I bet no one here is not a copyright violator. Because the minute you go onto the internet and you do certain things, like download music, or maybe inadvertently share something with somebody, you may be breaking the law. The other thing that's happened is that public domain has deteriorated. So in the United States and many countries, so this is maybe not relevant to some countries, and I think that uh, you know, the WIPO is pushing it, so you'll eventually be affected by it, is that the term of copyright keeps getting extended. So in the old days, uh, copyright was only 14 years, and it keeps, the US Congress keeps extending when copyright expires. So this is public domain. It used to be that after 14 years, all copyrighted work enter the public domain, which means that you could use it, copy it, share it, do whatever you want. So most old works, like Shakespeare and all these things, they're not copyrighted and we're free to use them. And it used to be that the work would enter this public domain. But because here they extended it, and they extended it, and they extended it, um, all of this that should have been in the, the public domain, actually only this is in the public domain. Right? So all this work with copyright extension has made it so that now, for practical purposes, since they keep extending it, all work is perpetually under copyright. And the difficulty about this, I don't have a slide for this, is that there's a very small couple of percent of works that are actually in print, where you, you can find the publisher and you can ask permission. More than 90% of works are out of print. You can't find who the author is. So they're called orphan works. So legally, you can't copy them because you have to ask permission. But technically, you can't copy them because you can't find out who the author is. And it's just sitting in the library. And this is the whole fight that Google Books and all these guys are going through. But this is kind of a big dilemma because all these works, except for a small sliver that's owned by Disney and some of these big guys, most of these works are just works that are completely outside of our ability to use them, either for education or entertainment or anything like that. So this is another problem um, of the public domain. This is. Uh, more of a legal problem. Um, so Creative Commons is a nonprofit. I'm the CEO. Uh, we have people in 80 countries. And uh, it's, uh, my job, most of my job is to actually run around and try to raise money for this nonprofit. 
But so if you go back to before Creative Commons existed, to 2002, you'll see that uh, there is a small amount of work that was in the public domain, which meant that you could use it without asking permission because it was very old work. And then most of the work was um, all rights reserved, which means that it was copyrighted and you had to ask permission. And what happened after Creative Commons and now that we have started to uh, release our stuff, what, we've, what our licenses do is we permit people to mark their works with what we call some rights reserved. So you says, for this kind of use, ask permission. But for this kind of use, go ahead and use it without asking permission. And I'll describe them a little bit more. But if you look now, so we have on the one hand, we have uh, no rights reserved, which is the really old works. And then you have some, some rights reserved, which are works that you can use without asking permission, um, as long as you follow certain rules. And then you still have probably half of the world, uh, which is uh, um, all rights reserved, you must ask permission. So let me explain what Creative Commons is a little bit. If you go to our website, there's a place that says license. So Creative Commons is a lot of legal lawyers and a lot of technical guys. So you say license, and then it asks you a bunch of questions. You have to decide. So one, one thing that we have as a default on all of our licenses, um, you can use my work, but you must give me attribution. So if I use your photograph, if I use your text, I have to say, this is where I got it, and here's a link to that person. Then one, another one is a question that we say, as a result of the work, let's say I use your work and um, I create another work, can I then just go ahead and sell it? Or do I have to then give you back the work under the same Creative Commons license? That's called share alike. Another one is no derivatives. So many documentary producers or photographers will say, okay, you can use my work, but I don't want you to mess with it. I want you to keep the story intact. I want you to keep the image, don't draw a mustache on my face. That's no derivatives. The other one is non-commercial. And this is a very popular one. It's a problematic one because the definition is actually quite difficult. But basically this means that you can go ahead and use your work, this work, but don't use it in a way that's primarily for commercial gain. And so a lot of musicians will do this where they want to continue to sell their music, but want to allow their music to be shared among users on a file sharing network, for instance. So if you pick those yes, no, and put them together in a combination, you end up with six licenses from the most permissive, which is do anything you want, just give me permission or give me attribution, all the way down to don't use it for commercial use and don't edit it, don't modify it. Okay? And these are all the combinations of those. And so what you do is when you go to our site, uh, you just answer these questions, and then you click Select a License, and it will spit out this license. It's, this is, we're trying to make this easier, but right now this is uh, what you get on our website. So you get a little logo that shows you the users on the website, um, which license it is. So this says uh, Creative Commons Attribution. And if you copy this uh, HTML and paste it into your website, you, you get the logo and the click-through and all that. Right? So we don't want everyone to have to do this, but this is one way to do it. And then once you get to the site, if you click on the logo, you get to what we call the deed. So the deed is what we call human readable. Right? So, so you can go to this and say, it says very clearly, you can share it, you can remix it, you must provide attribution, and it, um, it uh, tells you exactly what you can do. If you see up there, there are 50 different languages, so you can click it and see it in every language. So we will have Arabic this year. The Jordan will be our first license. We have 50 jurisdictions who are working on porting this. But the other very important part is we have a human, I mean, a, a lawyer readable code. So this is for judges and lawyers to read. It's a big, thick contract in legalese, which you probably don't want to read, but you can. But this is written in the language and associated with the local law of that country. Because each law has a slightly different uh, copyright law. And this is to make it so that you could take this uh, license into a court and, and use it in that country. Um, and another very important thing is we're working with the World Wide Web Consortium, which is the standards organization that creates standards for the web. And we've created a way to put this copyright information into the HTML, the metadata around the, the web stuff, so that we can mark up the works with the copyright. So when you copy and paste, the copyright information goes along with it. The attribution information goes along with it so that you can build tools. So right now, Yahoo and Microsoft and Google, they all are starting to understand this format. So for instance, on my page, and again, this is gobbledygook for people who don't write HTML, but for people who write HTML, 
in addition to being uh, linked to my um, web page, this basically says uh, this, this, this book is, uh, um, should be attributed to Joey Ito. It's using this Creative Commons license. And for additional permissions, you can go to this other site and get the link. But this, this may look like gobbledygook, but what's very important is now our Creative Commons licenses are all machine readable. So all the tools and all of the services are starting to understand Creative Commons licenses so that you don't have to do that copy-paste of licenses. If you go to Google and you go to advanced search, you can search for pictures of Aman that I can use without asking permission in my, in my proposal, for instance. Um, so we've got, uh, let's see. So these are, the, these are the, South Africa's the only place that actually has a, a valid jurisdiction. Uh, we've got a couple of countries uh, in development in Africa, but we're still slow. The reason I moved to the Middle East be is because most of Africa and Middle East is the place where we need the most work in terms of proliferating the licenses. Uh, Russia, we're just about done. So once we get that, I just need to focus on, on this area. Um, and right now, we have approximately uh, 250 million pieces of content that are licensed under a Creative Commons license on the internet now. A lot of them are on Flickr. 100 million photos on Flickr are licensed under a Creative Commons license. I didn't force them to do that. Um, and Wikipedia is in the middle of a vote. So Wikipedia was created before Creative Commons. So they actually use, this is somewhat technical, but they use a software license created by the Free Software Foundation that's designed for software manuals. So basically, it's kind of clunky. It says you have to attach the actual license agreement to each piece of work when it goes somewhere. You can't just make a link. There's all these issues with it. So we talked to the Free Software Foundation. It's taken years and years and years. But Wikipedia is just in the middle of finalizing a vote whether to switch Wikipedia to Creative Commons. Now, this is a very important because even though the Wikipedia is about sharing and is free license, and Creative Commons is sharing and free license, just like you can't have two versions of the internet, even if they're both open, they won't connect together, just like the old days. Right now, you have little pockets of knowledge. You have universities that call themselves open. You've got Wikipedia, you've got Flickr, and a lot of this content can't mix because even though they're spiritually the same because of the legal code, it's not compatible, they're not the same, you can't mix. And this is the tragedy. And so I used to be on the Open Source Initiative board. There are probably hundreds of open source licenses. If you have two open source projects that are using two different licenses, you can't get them back, you can't get them together. And this is a real tragedy. And so what we're trying to do with Creative Commons, it sounds a bit imperialistic, and countries like Japan are resisting me strongly, saying Creative Commons is an American plot to control open content, and so they're making all this blah, 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 blah commons, blah, 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 commons. But it's actually very important that we have one internet, uh, one ethernet, and one uh, uh, copyright license for sharing. But hopefully Wikipedia will be Creative Commons soon, and the total will be bigger. Um, but let me talk a little bit about business now because we're at the, an entrepreneurship discussion. So there are some interesting success stories and some examples I want to show. Star Rec is a funny example. It's some students for 15,000 euros made a, a full-length uh, movie. It's a, it's a parody of Star Trek and Star Wars. Um, and it's a Finnish... Oh, it's working. Okay. Oh, it's, this is working, isn't it? Okay. It was downloaded eight million times, and um, it just for free, obviously. But because of that, it became the most successful movie in the history of Finland. And in addition to that, it created a huge rise of fans. And then suddenly, people were pirating and selling it on the streets in Russia. The vendors, right? And then the movie. Um, studios approached them and television studios approached them and wanted to pay them money and so be they gave it away for free not thinking about making money it became hugely popular created a cult following and then they started making money from it right so it's kind of a non-intuitive thing um, this is Nine Inch Nails which is a band and they have a, a CD called Ghost and they licensed under a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial share alike license which is relatively restrictive but it basically means you can remix the music and share it with your friends but you can't sell it, and you have to re allow everyone else to remix it as well. Um, and they launched the site. And this is also an important part about the internet, because if you remember in the old days, um, if you distributed a CD, it was a little box 
that you put in a, in a truck and it ended up on the rack and it was all the same size, all the same price and you were paying Tower Records who was paying some big record company who gave a little bit to the, fa to the artist. So the fan didn't feel very connected to the thing and the price was a fixed price and um, the margin um, was, you know, it was paying for all the distribution. Well now with the internet, they made their own site and they said, okay, free download. There's a $5 download that gives you a couple of extra fancy things. A box set CD, a deluxe edition with this, I got this one with a really nice photo book, 75 bucks, and a $300 ultra deluxe limited edition. Everybody, each one is signed, limited edition, we only have 2,500 copies. Sold out the first day. In the first week, they made $1.6 million on this, even though they gave away all the music for free. And even though the music is free and free to download here, they put also the music onto Amazon.com's MP3 site, where you can download and you pay money. It's the number one selling song on Amazon last year as well. Right? So this is kind of crazy for the music guys. They're like, okay, we used to sell this stuff, but now, and they say, oh, but this merchandise business is a small business. But if you think about it from the perspective of the fan, they're saying, okay, please remix it and share it with yourselves. You can go to BitTorrent and get it. But you know, if you're fans, you're really gonna want this because we're like really appreciative. This is our page, this is our home. So there's a couple things happening here. The fan is much closer to the artist, so they feel like they're talking to the artist. It's much more authentic, right? And then the other thing is that there's no middleman, so you're not paying some distribution channel. Actually, the download, Amazon come download sales store fee that these guys have to pay to Amazon is $35 flat fee. It's very cheap, right? So all these tools like PayPal and all these tools about how to monetize your fans have gotten so easy that the fans can do most of this, uh, the, the artists can do most of this stuff themselves. So really it's gone from getting a lot of people to pay a little bit of money each to getting a fewer number of people to pay more money each and you get the cash more efficiently because the transaction cost is lower. So this is kind of an interesting example, sort of a wake up call to the music industry. Um, this isn't business but um, President Obama all during his campaign was uploading his pictures on Flickr using a Creative Commons license. And so what was great is I remember I was in Japan during his inauguration and uh, the Japanese broadcaster wanted to use his picture. And they said, oh, we have to write a fax and get permission. And I was like, no, it's Creative Commons. You don't have to ask permission. Oh, great. Okay, so they used the picture. Now just imagine if every, in normally every single broadcaster would send a fax to the Obama campaign and they would have to get permission and they would have to write permission and think of this cost of... Um, that suddenly disappears because of course Obama would let every broadcaster broadcast and use his photograph. You know, there's no reason he would say no. And so saying you don't have to ask permission for these uses makes total sense and um, because he's a smart guy. Um, and so exactly at, at noon during the inauguration they updated the White House site and they put uh, Creative Commons uh, in the White House page. And this is a slightly old screenshot. They actually have the icon now. We had to fix their HTML for them. but. Um, but now, so the White House is, uh, is Creative Commons. Actually, I don't have the slide in here, but Al Jazeera also released um, a whole bunch of their Gaza footage under a Creative Commons license. And uh, the Rai, I guess, is the Italian broadcaster used it with attribution. And the guys at Al Jazeera are telling me that um, they've gotten so many business leads from sharing their content full quality. They're the first broadcast to do full quality broadcast uh, content that they've gotten so many business leads from it that it's worth the cost of shooting all of this stuff and giving it away for free. And so a lot of these things, um, you can think about it as a marketing um, tool. You can think about it as uh, uh, access to knowledge. For instance, um, university professors sharing content, uh, MIT sharing their courseware, a school in Vietnam teaching the courses, and then the students then ending up at MIT because they have uh, learned about, because of MIT. So there's a whole world we call open courseware, which is starting to use Creative Commons, but is, uh, we're trying to standardize around it. Um, there are databases of scientific knowledge, there are patents. So this whole idea of sharing, both to lower the cost, uh, to increase distribution, and to make uh, innovation is something that in the past always required a lawyer, right? So if, you, if one broadcaster wanted to broadcast something from us, another broadcaster, you'd both fly to Cannes, you'd have champagne, you'd make a deal, you'd call your lawyers, your lawyers would you know, hire translators and they'd charge you $100,000 and you'd buy a television show for $10 million and it was fine. 
But when two professors are trying to share courseware or two teachers are trying to share pictures from their students, you don't want to hire a lawyer and pay $5,000 for a transaction that's only worth $25. That we call failed sharing because without the lawyers, it wouldn't happen. It's the same in the old days when you wanted to connect commuters, computers together. When Hertz rent a car connected with American Airlines, they pay $10 million to a bunch of consultants to connect the computers together. Of course, that makes business sense for them. But when you know, a, a, a small NGO in one country wants to connect their database with another NGO, now it's, uh, the technology is there, but the legal part is very difficult. And you still have to hire lawyers, you still have to tr hire translators, and that's what we're trying to solve is this uh, uh, transaction cost. And then finally, this is uh, Cory Doctorow, who's an author, and he's put all of his books online under a Creative Commons license. And again, some books, you know, very, very popular book from a very bestseller um, author, probably if he made it available for free, he would sell less books. But for people who have a lot of potential demand versus actual demand, there will always be what we call cannibalization, which is losing some of your sales to the free download. But you also gain a huge amount of demand. And so it's just about practical mathematics and business sense. If your potential demand is way greater than your actual demand by making it free, it's much more likely people will talk about it, people will blog about it, people will copy it and share it, and it will often increase your actual demand. So it depends on the author. For academic books like Bloomsbury Academic now are making their academic books available for full download under a Creative Commons license, and you do a print on demand for the reprints. Because obviously, if you want to put it on your shelf, use it with your students, you're not going to sit and print out a 100-page book on your printer. You're going to order the book from Bloomsbury, and also, um, hopefully, um, there's a little bit of the social norm, which is that you, know, you should pay for something. But instead of making it, forcing people to do it, I think the other thing is that we um, try to get people to uh, do it because it's the right thing. And I'll shift to a couple of other examples that aren't uh, Creative Commons, but something just to twist your mind a little bit. So Tecnobrega, I don't know if we have any uh, Brazilians here, but Tecnobrega is a kind of music in Brazil. Um, and I hope the music doesn't go crazy. So this, this is a Tecnobrega party. And it's usually, it's all this kind of DJ equipment, it's techno, it's very low cost music to make and you know, hundreds of thousands of people come and go crazy in kind of this very Brazilian way. And there are these DJs that have these immense machines that go like this and blah, blah, blah. And this is, you can imagine kind of, I think, what it's like, right? But this music scene is very different than music scenes in what we're, that we're used to in the West. I think there may be something you can learn, um, for instance, in Jordan from this Tecno Brega scene. Because what in Brazil, everybody is selling pirated stuff on the streets and um, none of this is um, giving copyright to the owners, right? So all the normal labels like Sony, these guys make no money in Brazil. But what the Techno Brega guys do is they go to these guys and they give them the music. And they say, please, promote my music. And the way that it works is that the, uh, the bands go to the recording studio and it's very, very cheap because it's all little computer stuff now. And then they go to the street vendors and give the music away. And then all the popular music it becomes popular because the street vendors are the ones where the kids start to share the music and learn about the music. They're kind of the radio. They're the ones that sort of promote the thing. And then the, so the public goes and gets it there. Then the contract, concert hall say, okay, you're very popular in the street. We want to book you in our concert hall. We want to book you in our venue. And the sound system companies say, oh, we, you're big and you're important. We're going to sponsor you. We're going to give you equipment. We're going to sponsor the party. And then the public goes to the party. And it turns out at the party, the public pulls out the wallet and pays for the real DVD, the real CD, the jacket, the everything, because there's a point at which the user experiences the actual value of this music, which is these crazy parties, right? So the street vendors is a place where the public is sampling the music to try to figure out what they like, to share the music, and that part is not the value part of this value chain. The value chain is when they all get together and they all listen to their favorite music and they're dancing and singing and kissing and doing all kinds of things, right? So what's interesting, again, is that then we have these people who are the producers who are funding the parties and also sponsoring these bands. And the good bands are making millions of dollars a month. And the good um, promoters and the good investors are making millions of dollars a month, right? This is way more than any of the record companies in Brazil can expect to make. And there are other scenes like um, um, Bal Funk, like different regions in Brazil. I mean, it's a huge population, so it may be slightly different than uh, in Jordan. But 
this kind of thing has nothing to do with copyright. And the important thing, the reason I show this slide, is that it's really important to understand the behavior of the people and when they're willing to pay, where the value is, because this is a thing that has changed dramatically. Um, I'll give a, let's see, time, okay. I'll give a, another example. This is a Japanese example. So this is a software called Vocaloid software. And Vocaloid software is software where you type in the vocals of a song and the character sings it for you. And this is, was marketed, it's a, it's a normal field that has, um, you know, makes some okay money. But this, this company decided to target the computer nerds because they were starting to make this, they call it desktop music publishing, right? But they decided that they'll use this um, young girl's voice, 16 year old girl's voice, because the girl vocalist was always the hardest um, part for the nerds to fill. But they also made this car cartoon character. And they said, by the way, we'll let you use the cartoon character without any copyright or any trademark. So there were sites that created hundreds and thousands of versions of this cartoon character. And they said, okay, we're, not, we're just going to use this because we want this to become a way for people to communicate with each other so that when they use this Vocaloid software, um, they can uh, associate this character with it. And they actually sold millions of dollars worth of this software compared to uh, thousands of dollars of most of the software. And then some of the top CDs last year were made with the software and they all used this character on the screen and became a big, huge cult following. People started making figurines and selling them for, you know, this, is, this one is for $70, you know, and it's crazy. There's a whole cult following around the figurines. And for this kind of commercial use, they actually asked for royalties. So this company is making royalties off of this character. And um, some companies are now making 3D animation software just so you can make animation with this character. And then there's a very weird site in Japan, which is the YouTube of Japan. It's called Niko Niko Doga. And it, the difference between YouTube and Niko Niko Doga is Niko Niko Doga lets you write uh, text on top of the videos, right? So it allows these users to participate. So this is a, a Hatsune Miku Vocaloid video. And all this text that you see around is people typing in and then um, posting these comments. And some of them is cheering and um, some of it is uh, lyrics of the song. But there's a whole community that develops around um, the, the video. And it's, you know, it's almost like YouTube comments, but it's a little bit different because they actually get to participate. It's more like karaoke than it is about commenting on this thing. So this is, this is so far, you, you, you could, and, and the very important thing is most of this innovation is happening from the users, right? It's not some really smarty pants guy in a research lab trying to figure out the next Walkman. It's like watching the behavior of the kids and moving it because all of this started out as a text bulletin board and it's just this merger of these very weird consumer cultures to create this site. And so then the next step was the Communist Party of Japan. Now this is the stodgiest, most boring, most failing party in Japan, Unfor not unfortunately, but they, they are. And no one cares about them in Japan, especially the young people. So they had nothing to lose. So what they did was they posted their videos on Niko Niko Doga. And the Japanese kids would never watch this guy. This is the head of the party because he's kind of a boring looking guy and he talks for an hour here. And if it were on TV, no one would watch it. But since they put it on Niko Niko Doga, what it turns out this guy is talking about the treatment of temporary workers, which is a really important issue for young kids in Japan. And then everybody started reading and posting and blogging this thing and then because of all these comments of people talking about it, the Communist Party has recently become hugely popular among young people, right? And from a copyright perspective, you know, these guys, I mean, uh, the other parties don't do this because they're afraid of losing control of their brand, they're afraid of the interaction, they're afraid of what's going to get written. But the Communist Party, since partially because they had nothing to lose, actively engaged the youth culture and they connected with it. And it's, to me, this is kind of, important because um, the point really is that I think one of the things that we're, that most of the companies miss is that there's a huge generation gap. This is my picture I took in the train in Japan. And the, most of the people who are writing the proposal um, approvals are people like this. And most of the people using the software and the tools are people like that. And I think that one of the things that's been very successful in Japan in terms of innovation is that even the big companies always watch the behavior of the young people 
and try to adapt to that. You know, so the big problem is when the record industry in America says, okay, we don't like this file sharing behavior, we're going to make it illegal, we're going to sue the kids and put them in jail, and we want you to go to the store and buy more CDs. Or now iTunes was a big difference, but it's still kind of like, iTunes is still a 30-year-old experience, right? Most of the users of iTunes are in their 30s and, and 40s, right? The really young kids still probably don't really like iTunes. And so I think what's important in addition to this innovation of open networks is a bottom-up. What you have to do is watch what the young kids are doing, which is many of you in, to a certain extent, but even kids who are younger, and then try to figure out where they're willing to pay, where they're feeling the value. And one of the things that's really important is I, I call it the content context spectrum. So if you go, content to me is something like a book or a, um, a CD, something that's like a thing, right? There's in, content inside, but it, you, you can ship it around. It's a noun, right? And then if you went, so if you go, there's a books, and then there were uh, video games, which were slightly more interactive. And then there was karaoke, which you were, it was more interactive, it was participatory, where you were part of the content. And then you have texting and blogs where it's just you, right? And I think that people now are paying money to participate. They're not paying money to consume. So the whole word consumer is also kind of getting old, I think, right? So most of the companies that I've invested in, you know, uh, Twitter, Flickr, the blog companies, we're charging the people who produce, not the people who consume, right? And this is a really big difference. And if you look at the behavior of people, most people are more excited about speaking up. I see most of these people here, they would rather be speaking than listening, I bet, you know? And so I think that what's really interesting is you have to think about how the behavior of the kids is changing into a participatory and a um, expression as something that has value and people are willing to pay for. And then I'm gonna finish with this example. This is a pager. And I, I don't know if you remember, the old guys used to, still some of them carry this around. And this is a numerical pager in Japan, but it became a huge hit among young girls in Japan. And what they did was they came up there with their own code so that this number meant this and this number meant that. And they texted each other. They could type really fast on the pay phones. And they were all only numbers that they being getting. And there was a huge code system that people even wrote books about so that you could in numbers say, I love you, I'll meet you at Hachiko at six o'clock. Just in numbers, right? So even though the interface sucked, the users innovated how to use this, despite the fact that it sucked, and the girls used it, little girls, teenage girls, used it more than businessmen did. But the good thing about the Japanese guys at the time, the companies, they said, oh wait, this is interesting. Let's merge this and put text onto the phone and use email and sell it to little kids instead of to these businessmen. And this is where I think a lot of the Americans fail. Americans always try to sell to people like themselves. So the big businessmen, they make trio and they're always selling enterprise, they're always trying to sell business applications, whereas Japanese always start with the little kids and the users, and then they take that and create the interface and then try to shove it into the adults. And that's why, at least in mobile phones, Japan has been a little bit more popular. This is a little pager with lots of um, pre crust stamps on it. This is from the 80s. So now we have uh, cellular phones everywhere in Japan. Um, but I think, you know, these are just some ideas to think about. So I think that the, the key takeaways, I think, is, you know, Open networks, innovation without asking permission, listening and looking at the people who are actually the future, the young people and how they're going to use it, and um, being very open and iterating and working small and taking risk and having fun. Thank you. So I guess we have time for questions, if anybody, or comments. <laughs> Should we get a mic? Okay, w wait one second, we'll get to your mic. Uh, uh, special uh, language that uh, girls use. Uh, 
are they still in use in Japan? Because in the Arab world, we had a problem with mobiles before they didn't support uh, Arabic SMS. So uh, 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 we used to write Arabic in Latin letters, and uh, some uh, numbers were used with uh, in conjunction with them. Yesterday came out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought uh, uh, it still exists, but uh, right. Oh, the, the old Japanese. Okay. Regarding uh, Twitter, you told me that uh, what's important is to create value and to create followers, right? Uh, do, don't you think that this is the same mentality of the dot com bubble in, in the 1990s? Because that's what everyone's saying just create value, you know, and uh, you get visitors and then everything will come. Get, uh, and the model and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, so one more th okay. last one is uh, <laughs> since you're an investor in Silicon Valley, uh, how do you see the economic crisis affecting the VC industry there? And uh, how, do you see, how do you think that the VC industry should react? Because I think the VC industry in the last uh, decade uh, you know, has been acting uh, in an reaction way. So if there's dot com bubble, they don't invest in anyone, even if they, are, you know, uh, if they have a great business model and a great uh, product. Okay, so um, in terms of the, are you talking about Japan for the special characters? Okay, so we st we have keyboards that are like mobile phones that you can plug into your computer with a USB because people type faster like this than they do on the keyboard. So at least in the typing, the old style of typing now on the 10 key mobile is actually f people write novels on books on on mobile phones, and actually the best-selling novel in Japan uh, was also written and also purchased on the mobile phone. The, the, the text itself has become more sophisticated, normal Japanese fonts, but the way of writing and also a lot of the, the style is still uh, evolved from the old style. Um, but no, people don't use numbers to communicate what they can do in text. But it's, it's the, the market, the, the users are always ahead, so they make their little uh, characters for smiley faces and stuff, and then all the companies create little icons that the users can use. So it, the, the users and the, the companies evolve this together. Um, with respect to your, your question about Twitter, I'll connect it with the question about the bubble because I think it's a, it's a similar thing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's not for sure whether Twitter is going to be successful or not. Um, you never are sure. Um, but for instance, you know, I was the chairman of InfoSeq, and until Google came out, InfoSeq was actually quite successful. Um, when, we first, when they first started InfoSeq, they were trying to charge the user for every search on the internet. Can you imagine if you went to Google and had to pay, use PayPal every time you searched for something? But you know, the thing was that but we focused on trying to create value, which was trying to, we said, okay, there are going to be web pages, and people are going to want to search. And as long as there's some value there, we'll figure out some model for it, we figured out at the time, this was old school, but we figured out the banner ads, and eventually we were able to convert what was a bunch of users using a function, which is search, and convert it into money. Um, I think that uh, uh, Google was the same thing. When they first started, they didn't have advertising. They didn't have the idea of AdSense. All these models come later. And again, sometimes you have companies that haven't yet monetized and may not monetize. Some companies fail. but. I've seen, as an investor, so many business plans with the perfect business model, but they have no users, okay? The biggest single reason companies fail is because they have no users, because what we call distribution cost, right? So Google pays billions of dollars a year just to get people to the site. I'm on the board of the Mozilla Foundation, and we make Firefox. I think Google paid us last year $70 million for all of the people we sent to the site from the search box of Firefox, okay? Google pays for every one of those people because they can tr turn the search from us into twice as much money with the advertising on the Google page. And Google is actually profitable, right? And I think that if you look at, yes, of course there were sites that were popular that failed, that had lots of users, but most of those failures that you talk about in the dot-com were failures in finding any users. No one went to pets.com. No one used Webvan. You know, well, actually, Webvan was a slightly different reason, but a lot of these grocery store sites. And, and the, if, if you look at the, 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 the problem in a slightly different way, we'll go back to the music business. Um, it used to be that the delivery was the biggest part of the business, right? Printing, 
the content and shipping it and putting it on the store, or if it's a television company uploading it onto the satellite and producing it. The manufacturing and distribution of content was the biggest business, and it was looked like a manufacturing business. Well, now with multiple channels, in, someday you're going to have every single song in the whole wide world in a little iPod this size. And the difficulty is not going to be how do you deliver the music to the user. It's how do you discover the music you want to listen to? How does the music discover the person that wants to listen to it? So I say it's going from the delivery problem and the manufacturing problem to what's called